Welcome to BA Bootcamp. My name is Luc Vermaas and together with Gert Zwedek, we ensure that you stay informed of the latest developments in the field of business analysis. We combine different theoretical approaches with our extensive practical experience from the field so that you immediately leave our sessions with tangible tips and ideas to put in practice in your daily work. Have fun watching and if you want to be staying informed in our latest videos, follow us on YouTube. Okay, so thank you for joining us again in our uh, sixth episode of the Babel Contangled series. So uh, it's uh, now, uh, well, a few months ago that we started this initiative and we're very happy that we are now at episode six. Still three to go after this one. So uh, it's a uh, uh, 400 pages thick book. So there's quite some uh, some content, uh, but uh, I think, yeah, we're, we're, we're getting there. And I think today is one of the, I would think, well, not call it most important because everything is important, but at least one of the key tasks that most people that perform business analysis activities uh, will have to do tasks within the uh, knowledge area requirements analysis and design definition. But before we jump into that, just quickly highlighting these are the episodes we have already concluded. So if you're interested in um, any of the previous episodes, feel free to uh, visit our YouTube page. Uh, so all the videos are posted uh, afterwards and you can just look at uh, them in your own time. Just a quick recap or, or on where we are and what is still to come. Uh, so we already discussed the key concepts of the BABOC. We've talked about the different perspectives of a business analyst, uh, but we are now uh, covering, I would say, the most, uh, uh, the biggest part of the BABOC, which are the different knowledge areas. Uh, which consists out of tasks that a business analyst can uh, well need to bring to the table uh, to uh, perform either project work, business analysis activities, anything that can help you in your daily work. So today it's all about requirements analysis and design definition. So what is requirements analysis and design definition? Well, basically it has everything to do with the you know analysis of the requirement. I mean, you have you conducted the analysis you have done your elicitation uh, you have prepared your elicitation but now you have a lot of information and all of that information now needs to be uh, uh, well specified modeled of course need to be verified whether hey does it indeed is correct that this is uh, the requirement we have captured uh, where also validation is a critical aspect of it because you do not want to have uh, a product being built on unvalidated requirements because that will also lead to unexpected results in the end of the project. Um, and uh, an important part of that is uh, to define the requirements architecture. So this, although the chapters of the BABOC are uh, designed in, in, in this order, uh, we will apply a little bit of a different order because uh, we think that it's always good to start with defining the requirements architecture before you go in to the next chapter. So just to give that as a highlight, we will not go, you know, 7.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but we will start with uh, what we think is, is the key basic is the requirements architecture uh, definition. Just to quickly uh, recap maybe some of the content we uh, you know did in episode one uh, as we are talking about requirements just to quickly highlight the different requirements we have because that will help you also understand a little bit better uh, about the content we're going to discuss in the rest of the episode so uh, we all still remember that there are not just requirements from scratch requirements are there because there is a certain business need and uh, importantly enough when we are going to verify and we're going to validate requirements it's critical that you go back to the original uh, 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 I would say uh, business objective business needs to understand are these requirements still uh, a part of that business need or is this just loose hanging you know requirements that do not actually add to the value we are realizing so uh, just to to make sure that we kind of get this concept of we have business needs from these business needs that might come business requirements uh, which could be statements of goals objectives and any outcomes that are important and with that you get your maybe separate stakeholder requirements because a project is not often done in one silo multiple stakeholders could be there 
maybe have different requirements. Uh, therefore, it's very important to also identify which stakeholder has what requirements and add up to the ultimate business requirements that we have. And then in the end, what is then important is that we define this as, okay, this is our problem domain. We understand there are requirements, there are needs, uh, there are different stakeholders with, with requirements and needs. And then we can go into what we call more, let's say, the, the, the solution domain. So therefore, hey, we're now going to talk about solution requirements that we can kind of uh, distinguish between what we call functional and non-functional requirements. Uh, where functional, it's really about users being able to do certain things and non-functional being more, let's say, the behavior of the system. You know, that's very easy set, uh, but that's kind of how we distinguish uh, the two. And then we have, of course, very important, if you work on a project where you're not going to go from A to B in one go, uh, where you have maybe we're going to go from A to F, and in the middle, we can have, uh, you know, a state called uh, B, C, and E, which can have transition requirements, basically help you, you know, transition from A to B, from B to C, without going from A to F in one uh, go. And so this is kind of the landscape when we talk about requirements. Just a quick recap, I'm not going to go into detail. If you want to know more about this, uh, please watch back uh, episode one, because there we discussed in a little bit more, uh, more detail. And then the second thing maybe to highlight, uh, is that because we talk about requirements uh, requirements and design definition that uh, there is a difference between a requirement and a design, uh, but ultimately it's important that you realize that a requirement will lead, could potentially lead already to a intermediate design, which then can be used to gather more requirements, which will lead to a you know, further improved design. And therefore, you know, you will work in this circle until you come to that moment that everybody says, yes, this is exactly uh, what the requirements was saying. So requirements and design go hand in hand. It's not, although they are two separate things, they go hand in hand. And that is something I want to reiterate before we go into the content of this, uh, of this session today. Bring us to the first uh, topic of the requirements uh, design and uh, definition chapter, handing it over to, uh, to Gert, where we start again uh, with 7.4, which is defining the requirements architecture. Maybe you can tell a bit about uh, why we start with this, uh, Gert, and not with 7.1. Yes. What is your vision on that? Thank you, Luc. Uh, yes, I will. Um, the, the requirement architecture is all about thinking about what kind of models am I going to use for specifying and modeling? So the first step you should take is thinking about different viewpoints and views. So we have another slide on that one. So actually here you think about what type of models are we going to use for specification and modeling? So that's why we have the first uh part of this session on the requirement architecture you can show the next slide to make it more visual okay here you see um an an, uh, an example of some viewpoints uh functional viewpoints behavioral viewpoints data viewpoints you can have all kinds of viewpoints um to make sure you model the right things for your uh, system your solution to be um, those could be functional and um, more more uh, in in detail that could be a use case diagram diagram or you could choose um, an activity diagram or a data flow diagram so we're going to have a look at those later but first you need to make a decision so um, you can uh, uh, consider a solution as uh, something that's that's quite complex, and uh, because it's quite good morning, uh, because good morning. it's quite uh, complex, it may, you may need different viewpoints to to let people know what the system is all about. Uh, one of those viewpoints could also be a behavioral viewpoint. And if you need that in a certain situation, you might want to choose state chart diagrams to do that. So that's part of the UML family. 
as are uh, class diagrams. So class diagrams are a typical choice uh, to make when you consider the data viewpoint. Uh, you could choose PPNN diagrams for a process viewpoint. So if that's necessary for this particular situation, uh, well, then you make a, uh, the choice for a view a BPMN, and that's part of your uh, process viewpoint. Uh, you might need a UX viewpoint. Um, uh, for instance, wireframes, uh, uh, prototyping, uh, usability testing. Uh, and there may be also a lot more kind of viewpoints you might need. Yeah, so the first thing you need to do is uh, find out what kind of viewpoints are relevant for this particular situation. And uh, within a viewpoint, you might want to choose a couple of uh, diagrams you see uh, listed here. So that's what requirement architecture is about. The making the choice for a set of diagrams, models, to be able to um, specify what you're going to do next. Okay, the next slide uh, shows a business requirement document. And the business the requirement document is mostly used by uh, more formal organizations that use big, still big documents and that may have a chapter on the introduction or background. You may have a chapter on business process models to have some uh, more information on those. You may have some fun functional models like data flow diagrams or, or use case diagrams, data models using class diagrams or entity relationship diagrams, uh, a glossary uh, which lists all the definitions of the terms you use, uh, and you might want to use a, a requirement catalog. So uh, I have another slide on uh, as an example for a requirement a catalog. Uh, there all the requirements are listed. You see that here. You see all the requirements are listed uh, and all the attributes of each requirement you can fill in in this template. Uh, but again, this is not about filling in the template. This is about thinking about what do we need for um, a requirement catalog, for instance? What kind of attributes do we need for each requirement? And that's exactly. part I of think, a bigger um, document that's called the business requirement document. Yeah, yeah exactly. I think it's important to, to highlight the fact that this is not a, a um, how do you call that, a standard document. Yeah, so the technique it, itself, has, so to have this, it's a best practice to have a requirements catalog because it will help set a standard because often you are not the only one or the only business analyst working on a project therefore uh, making it easier for the team eh, for the product development team or anybody else to have a standard eh? and that standard is important which indeed is called product uh, requirement uh, catalog but the, the the attributes could be different depending on the organization the type of project you work in the type of regulation it goes through i mean uh, it, it can it can vary, so I think that's that's very important to uh, yes, it's important to have it, but don't just use it as a template, but also put in your own um, important attributes. Yeah, and you might want to adjust it in time. So maybe uh, in some occasions you won't need a, a data model, for instance, but you st still could use the template uh, and leave this chapter empty or you might want to add a new chapter. Uh, so that's all up to you to make the right decisions. So again, this is not about filling in the document, this is about making choices. What do we need for this particular uh, situation, project? Okay, uh, more often nowadays you see um, the, the product backlog being used. So in agile situations, uh, you can use a product backlog instead of a, a requirement catalog. So uh, it's more or less the same, but the requirement catalog is more a static kind of thing. 
like the business requirement document that grows in time and may, it may actually be a, a, a very big document uh, consisting of uh, like 100 pages or more. Uh, if you want to know more about this, you could always uh, you could check the the Valier. The Valier is a is a template you could use, uh, spelled V O L E R E R A E R E. Sorry. Uh, so that's that's typically a, a good business requirement document. But again, uh, nowadays Agile is being used more and more, and there you see the the product backlog uh, as. Uh, well, a, a choice being made by teams. So yeah, then we move on to specify and model requirements. Uh, as you can see on the left side of the, the, the diagram, you see requirement architecture as one of the guidelines and tools. So that's actually what you need as a, a, a guideline or tool. And what you can see on top are the elicitation results. So uh, in the last session we had, we were talking about elicitation. So you have been talking to your stakeholders. You know what they want. You know what they have been saying or uh, writing down on a on a piece of paper, and you that will be your input for this particular task. So the elicitation result <clears throat> uh, are your starting point to start specifying and modeling your requirements using uh, requirement architecture, using your modeling tools, for instance, Physio or maybe enterprise architecture. Um, you may also use requirement lifecycle management tools like JIRA. So JIRA is also a nice tool you could use. OK, so there you start specifying and modeling your requirements. And that leads, of course, to an output in which your requirements are specified and modeled. So they can be verified and they can be validated. OK, well, let's have a look at all the techniques. There is a lot of techniques you could use to uh, specify and model your requirements. And we're only going to look at a couple of those. So maybe in the next one, you we have user stories. <clears throat> user stories are being used a lot these days. Um, and they're typically used in, in Agile Scrum kind of projects or teams. Um, and those are very handy because it's functionality written from a user perspective. And they describe the what and not the how. So um, these are being written down on a piece of paper and being discussed uh, with the team. So the product owner talks with the stakeholders, writes it down, and these are being discussed with the team. And these are, these are being estimated by the team to make sure you can realize it within the time frame. And last but not least, there's acceptance criteria. And these are very important. And these are uh, <clears throat> a big part of the user story. So user stories actually are three parts, consist of three parts. First is the, the, writ the, the writing as you can see here in the 3 R format. The second one, one is the, the conversation you will have uh, based on the, uh, the writing, based on the user story. And third, there will be acceptance criteria. So we're going to have a look at the acceptance criteria later in this session. Uh, but first, there's the, the statement you can see here, which may be formal, or maybe informal. So you can write informal user stories, which are just a, well, a plain piece of text, or you can write it in a three R format. The R stands for role requirement and result. So um, as a, and then the name of the role, I need to, then you have the requirement, so that that is the, the rationale for the requirement. So if we have a look at the example, if you click on the next one, look, you see an example. As a customer, I need to be able to supercharge my vehicle using a credit card so that I can continue my journey. So this is typically uh, an example of a user story. You, uh, well, you can write down as a starting point for everything. So 
uh, elicitation results may actually lead to, um, well, uh, a, a user story being written down uh, in, a, in a workshop, for instance. So you can use a workshop to, to start writing down your user stories. Another technique uh, is the non-functional requirements. So um, there's actually loads and loads of non-functional requirements, and you only see a couple of them uh, here. Uh, yeah. Think about often the they are forgotten. Uh, often <laughs> they are forgotten. That is always uh, because this yep. is really talking about how we talk about users and, and interacting, which is important. But if you, you have, you know, I always use the example. If you have a user story where it says, uh, so let's take the example uh, as a as a customer, I need to supercharge my uh, my vehicle and pay my credit card so they can continue my journey. But if you don't specify that with non-functional requirements, saying that actually that charging needs to happen within you know 15 minutes instead of five hours, uh, then it can the outcome can be quite uh, different different per per what the feedback is of the customer. So. Therefore, never forget the non-functional requirements that really talk about, you know, these these topics. <laughs> exactly. What about security? Uh, we need things to be secure. Uh, data needs to be secure these days. Uh, think about usability. Uh, how usable is the solution? Uh, so it's not only about performance, it's also about compliance, things like that. So you can actually use a, a checklist uh, the, the ISO standards has a lot of, uh, I call it the illity lists. So you can use the illity lists to check whether your solution, um, well, is, is right for, uh, considering all these non-functional categories. Okay. Other techniques. Uh, this is a more traditional technique, the data flow diagram. Um, I think this is still very useful, um, especially in situations where you have a lot of um, systems uh, or uh, users. Um, so this, you have the, the, the rectangles that show the, uh, the outside world and you have one circle and that's your system. So uh, your system is part of a bigger whole and that's a, a context. So what this actually shows is that you may have users. So you see uh, users uh, that may have, will have a user interface with the FCS system. But there will also be system interfaces and especially those are very interesting. So where does the system FCS get its information from? Where to what other systems will this system uh, send information to? So for the purists, uh, you may only be interested in the, the boxes just outside the FCS system and not uh, the other boxes you see uh, in between. So there's there's boxes between um, you see on top and uh, the one underneath that, that shows Leonardo. Uh, <clears throat> but sometimes you may want to, to have a look at those as well. So where does information come from? Where does information go to? And what are the, the outside systems your system you're considering, you're, you really want to know, uh, is communicating with? So you can use data flow diagrams. That's the one you see here. And you can, on top of that, you can do an interface analysis. So if you have a new system that will be connected with your system, um, just write it down and adjust your context diagram. So this is typically a context diagram that shows all the systems your system is communicating with showing the information and it doesn't show any order. Yeah, this doesn't show any uh, sequence. It just shows what information is going in, what information is going out, uh, and what are the systems that my system is communicating with and who are the important uh, users of your system. It may, it may even be an organization that sends you some information. So that may also be the case. 
Then there's data dictionary. Um, a data dictionary typically um, shows you what, for instance, um, the things are that um, is be being uh, described next to the arrows, the information. So we have, for instance, um, this is all about payments. So we have payments going from Vicozo to FCS that says facturen verantwoordingen in Dutch. Uh, and you may say, well, what does that mean? So what is a facture consisted of? What does the invoice, what, is it cons what does it consist of? What is it part of? How do you define that? That's what you put in your data dictionary. So I often use all these three techniques together. Yeah, to make sure what information is going in, what information is going out. Remember, oftentimes we're talking about a solution that is an information system. So an information system gets information, processes the information, uh, stores the information, and in the end sends information to the outside world. So what are the other players in the outside world these are part of your context and these will be part of your interface analysis as well. And then there's use cases, uh, use case diagram you see here. Um, well, uh, the, the context diagram as a, a data flow diagram in the last slide was a black box. Uh, that was a black box context diagram. The use case diagram is a white box context diagram. So it also shows the outside world that's the things you see outside this rectangle, um, like customer and charger. And it's a white box uh, context diagram because it also shows the, the functional uh, elements, the BCL app in this case uh, is uh, consists of. So we have here, we have six, uh, we have 10 use cases. And we also see what the use cases are. Uh, it doesn't show any sequence. It just shows you um, who the actors are. An actor can be a, a stick figure on the left, showing that it's a person. And it can be um, a box, like you see on the right side, the charger. So actually, the customer can uh, can use the BCL app to start the charger you see on the on the right side. So there will be some uh, functionality within the BCL app that uh, in which you may uh, start a charger that is outside your app, of course. So what this means, you plug in your car. Um, uh, th th that's the hardware, of course, and then you uh, use your BCL app to start charging the charger. Okay, so, and of course, there's a lot more functionality to it than just the charging, but that's the next part of um, my story here. So maybe if you click, yeah, you can actually um, use this as a starting point. This will be your, your system functionality, as long as your system exists. Yeah, uh, that's that's the main difference between a user story and a use case. A user story is just a, a wish you have at a certain moment in time, whereas a, a use case is a part of your functionality of your system. It will be there as long as your system exists. You may have to do some adjustments, of course, uh, maybe based on a user story, so you actually can use them together, user stories and use cases. We do another session on that, Luke, I think, later. So we, we discuss the differences yeah, exactly. and the similarities. On the right side, you see a, a scenario, a use case description, which is, um, well, the elaboration of the start charging use case. And this will grow in time. And typically, this is a a dialogue between the actor on the left side, the customer, and the app itself. So this is all about requirements. Why? Because the, the, consumer, the customer wants to do something with the app 
and the app knows exactly what to do as a response. So they respond to each other all the time to make sure the customer is happy and in this case uh, is able to charge his or her car. Then the next slide. Okay, and of course you can also use another technique. Eh? So instead of uh, writing down use cases as text, you can also um, draw uh, an activity diagram, for instance, and that's part of the process modeling technique in the Babok, uh, all with its uh, yeah, own uh, syntax, of course. So it starts on top with customer who wants to uh, start the charging. The BCL app, BC app will react by asking what the charger code is. Well, the customer knows the charger code fills that in and then the BCL app knows what to do and in the end it will start the charger and it will end when the customer stops the charger. Okay, so you can also use these techniques. Um, yeah, I mentioned this one before. You can use a class diagram when you are interested in the data view. Point. So this is typically the data viewpoint and this in the end will be your uh, database. So if you want to uh, register, um, well, uh, who is the customer, um, what kind of membership he or she has, what kind of payment method he or she has, uh, what the vehicle is, um, and you want to know where and when this vehicle uh, is being charged, you may want to draw a, a concept model. Uh, so here you see a typical example of a concept model. And you can do that in combination with a glossary. So a glossary is another technique you can use, uh, which uh, describes all the, uh, the terms you use. So uh, the, the, the picture shows, uh, for instance, a customer. So what is a customer? Uh, a vehicle. What is a vehicle? Uh, what is a charge session? So you really need the glossary first to make sure you have the right definition. And if you've done that, you can start modeling all the uh, classes and combine them together uh, using the associations. Those are the lines between the boxes. But you only do that if you're interested in the relationship. If you don't want to register the relationship, well, just don't show them. This, this is what it's all about. And you may start drawing um, a class diagram like this and find out you still have new questions or you doubt or you may even have an assumption uh, but you always need to check the assumption with your stakeholders, of course. So the bottom line, always ask, okay, what do we need uh, for this particular situation? Uh, you see um, an association, a line may have a description besides it, like charge session takes place on a vehicle. So that's the name of your association. You don't need to fill that in but uh, well, it's more explicit. And you may have the cardinality of multiplicity. And you see, for instance, between charger and charge session, you see uh, a number one and you see a, a star. So the star means zero or more. And the one, of course, is minimum one, maximum one. What does it mean? Well, a charger um, may have multiple charge sessions. And given one charge session, there will only be one charger involved. Same with vehicle. Uh, a vehicle may be charged in a charge session or maybe have more charge sessions, uh, but one charge session is uh, taking place on just one vehicle. Okay, uh, a location may have one charger up to six. So if you want to register more than six chargers for one location, you will have a problem 
with your system. That's what this means. So if you want to, to register uh, eight charges at one location, you need to adjust this uh, class diagram. So that's what the requirements is all about. What you see is what you get. OK, uh, and of course, this will um, take time to have the right uh, model in the end. Uh, so we, we have multiple iterations. Well, the other technique, data, mod data modeling, uh, steps in a bit more. So this is in more detail. You will add uh, attributes to all these classes. And you may want to use the enumeration you see here. So what kind of methods do we have as a payment method? What kind of types uh, are the memberships? So you can have a standard membership or you can have a gold member uh, uh, membership. So you start adding details to your concept model yeah, and, and you end up with a data model. Yeah. yeah, especially work in, you know, uh, environments where, you know, work with integrations and you have to explain uh, maybe in a non-technical way, yeah, how does uh, data interacts with, uh, with, with objects or with other systems, then uh, typically these kind of models are, are good to, uh, to understand. And I think in itself, we can have a whole session, uh, probably a whole day on this, because uh, modeling uh, can go quite extensively, so we won't go in a lot more detail. Yeah, but it's just to give you an idea like what kind of type of modeling techniques do we actually have in our toolkit uh, that we could uh, that we could use yeah so we do a di different session on this one as well yeah. okay that was 7.1 so that was that was about specifying and modeling your requirements i think that's a very big part of what a ba does but uh, you also need to make sure uh, the, the, the requirements you modeled and specified are correct. Uh, so that what, that's what verifying is all about. So do they have the right quality? Same for designs, of course. So uh, make sure your requirements and designs meet the quality standards. Next slide, please. Yeah, and so you can have a check for whether they are atomic. Well, if you use user stories, they will be atomic. Uh, so this typically stands for uh, requirements written down in a certain way using text. Uh, are they complete? Are they consistent? So some of these characteristics uh, are important just for um, separate requirements as we saw in the requirement catalog some of them are um, important for sets of requirements like models are they complete do they uh, provide enough information to continue the work are they consistent uh, or do they conflict with each other um, are they feasible of course you need to make sure you can realize what you modeled yeah, are there, is there any ambiguity? Are they testable? Things like this, uh, are they prioritized? Important, we see that in the next session, we're going to have a look at the prioritization of requirements. So that's actually one of the quality requirements or quality uh, attributes. Yeah, and you can use reviews to do that. So uh, we're not going to see th these in uh, very high detail, but you can have more formal kinds of reviews, uh, even inspections, which are very formal and very, uh, well, big. Uh, and you can have informal walkthroughs. So that's the one I use most, is just use the refinement sessions, for instance, in, uh, in an Agile team. <clears throat> to make sure the the models you've written of uh, the the models you've uh, you made and the the descriptions you made are correct and are uh, elaborated in a, in a right way. And then there's validation. So besides your verification, where it's all about your quality, uh, you may also want to validate your requirements. And here it's all about uh, value. So make sure um, the things you've been doing 
um, are of value to your stakeholders. So you can also use your refinement sessions to do that. So verification and val validation of the elaborated requirements is a very important thing to do. So make sure you have elaborated uh, your requirements in the right way. So what is the right way? We can have a look on the next slide. Um, the right way is, uh, Luke uh, told us before about the problem domain and the solution domain, where here they are again. Uh, the business requirement on the left side, uh, connected to the stakeholder requirements. And here it's all about making sure you have the right um, choices made. So, uh, okay, we will, ha we have different stakeholder requirements. Uh, we found out uh, some features. How do the features relate to the stakeholder requirements? And how do the stakeholder requirements relate to your business requirements? And what you answer here is whether your features really add value to your organization. Do they fit the business requirements or not? That's what you do uh, in validate requirements. Uh, you may uh, want to choose, uh, well, for instance, stakeholder requirement nine. Um, yeah, well, you, you do this manually, so you can uh, do things and write a procedure. And so you won't, you, that will be part of your solution, of course. So your solution is not only your IT system. Uh, many cases it will be, but in many cases, in some cases, you will need some, some procedure to be right, uh, right, written down. Uh, so if that fits your stakeholder requirement properly, to be able to fulfill your business requirements, I think then you really have the right solution. So you have the right solution um, when you have the right features that fit your stakeholder requirements that add value to your business. So, and also that solution scope, uh, what is part of your solution and what is not part of your solution. So you might actually find features that are not part of your solution scope. Okay, so that's what alignment and solution scope is all about. To be able to validate your requirements. Well, uh, techniques to do this uh, is acceptance criteria. I mentioned them before. And you can also use evaluation criteria. Well, acceptance criteria are typically used for one solution, whereas evaluation criteria are used for multiple uh, solutions. So we just look at the acceptance criteria today. Um, so here we have value attributes, cost, performance, usability, and functionality, define requirements, and test. So if you click, Look, you will see uh, the user stories I mentioned before. So user story is an important part to write down your requirements, to make it visual for a team to work on. But on top of this, you will need some acceptance criteria. Um, for instance, testing uh, with a Visa card. So we were mentioning a credit card. What kind of credit card? Maybe we want to test the Visa card first. And we want to test it also with a MasterCard kind of Visa card. And maybe we also want to check whether an expired Visa card can be used or not. Hopefully not. So, but that, that's part of the acceptance criteria. So you really want to make sure you have the right acceptance criteria to be able to say, well, this is the right uh, product or not. Yeah, so that's what um, uh, va validating requirement is all about. Oh yeah, I thought this is this is not in the bar book, but I think this is a very important technique, the Kano model. Uh, Probably you've heard about dissatisfiers, satisfiers, and delighters. 
um, the, I think this is all about value. So um, if somebody, um, <clears throat> no, so suppose you have a product, um, uh, you have a system and you have, uh, you will replace that system with a new system. But your users are used to do certain things in the old system. So you really want to make sure the new system has the same features. You can still do the same things in the new system as you in your old system. Uh, if you don't do that, if you skip very important requirements in your new system and your, your users really want to make sure they can do their job properly, um, then we're talking about dissatisfiers. If it's not in the new system, I won't use the new system because I cannot do my job. So typically these are um, requirements that don't, uh, that don't make the, the customers very happy because they're used to, to, uh, to use it anyway. But if it's not in the product, they, are, they will be very uh, unsatisfied. So that's the red line you see here. And I, uh, most of the times the, uh, these are your must have requirements. So they add value to the stakeholders. If they're not in your system, forget it. Yeah. Then there's the satisfiers. The satisfiers are typically the, the requirements that um, the more you have them, the more satisfied your customers will be. So that's the straight line, the green line you see on the uh, the left bottom to the right top. The more you, the more it will be in your system, the more satisfied your uh, customers will be. And um, yeah, uh, maybe for a product that would be uh, for a car, for instance, that would be the range. Uh, for electric cars, the range, the more range you will have for the same price, uh, the better it is. Yeah, but um, yeah, if if it's not, if you pay a lot of money and you don't have a range, yeah, you cannot uh, go from one place to the other, people won't buy your product. So uh, the wow factors are, are tip, that's the last one, that's the orange one. Um, these are typically the, the requirements people won't ask for in the first place, but once they're in the product, they will be very satisfied. So if it's if you don't have it in your product, they won't be very unsatisfied. But if you add them on top of all the other um, requirements, people will be delighted and may even want to choose your product instead of your uh, competitors product, for instance. So that would be autonomous driving, for instance, for, for cars. Yeah. But uh, so again, the red one would be, um, it must have a steering wheel. A car must have a steering wheel. It must have, uh, well, uh, a way to, uh, to keep on, M must be safe. So if it's not safe, forget it. Uh, an unsafe car, nobody wants. So that's the, the dissatisfier. It needs to have some security. The range would be the blue one and the, the autonomous driving would be the orange requirements. So this is, I think, a very powerful technique to make sure you have your right requirements validated and what actually value means for your stakeholders. Seven, five, define design options. Okay, well, we have our, um, requirements uh, validated as you can see on top and as input we have the requirement architecture and we can start thinking about designs so uh, as we told you before designs are about the solution so here we go into think about what design options uh, are there in this particular occasion and what is the most suitable? So the most suitable, we're going to have a look at seven, six, but first we go into find all these design options. Okay. And yeah, there's the, the, the picture again. So 
we looked at the, the business requirement, the stakeholder requirements. That's actually the needs you see here. You see the features. So that's that's your uh, functionality of your new uh, system. We have looked at uh, number nine. That is that will be a procedure as we told uh, before. And then we go are going to look at um, different options. So one of the options would be <clears throat> OK, we're going to do everything manual. Well, that's not really a good option because in many cases some kind of automation will be much uh, more practical and much if, if more efficient, uh, much more secure. OK, so in many cases we choose to uh, a solution that will have a lot of automation in it. So if you choose for an automate uh, for automation, you can choose. OK, we can buy it or we can make it ourselves. So. Um, well, you see here the the green blue, the blue green. That's a, a, a decision you can make to make your own system that will be. Um, well, uh, a fit solution, yeah. Um, bespoke. Uh, but you can also choose to buy a solution. So uh, on the right side, you could choose a design option that has a couple of components. So that would be the orange design option you choose. So uh, you buy everything. You may also have a design option uh, two that is blue green. So you start to make your system yourself. So everything is bespoke. Everything is fit for your organization. You may choose to have a design option that's completely dark blue. So everything manual. And you can have a combination. So I think that's the most powerful one. You know what kind of solution uh, you need, you, you know what kind of feature you need and you start looking whether there's some kind of component uh, you can buy that exactly fits your features you're looking for. So that would be if the, if that's um, it, if that has a good price, that would actually be a good option. But if you cannot find it, for instance, your way of working is so specific for your organization, you might not find a, a good component to buy. So then you might choose the, uh, for instance, what's what's blue green here is component B and C are uh, components you make yourself, you build yourself, okay? And that's actually your requirement allocation. So uh, choosing the right components for the features you need. And you can imagine you can all have all kinds of combinations, possibilities for design options. And you might want to uh, have a vendor assessment to find out whether, um, yeah, what they have, what, what they need, what they provide. Yeah, so you see a couple of vendors mentioned here. Um, and that can actually be uh, some kind of pilot product you, uh, project uh, you use. Yeah, and during these vendor selection processes, which you have, so often they have these called so called RFPs, RFIs, uh, requests for proposals. Therefore, the requirements you already gathered and have uh, are of an essence for, in this case, a vendor to understand hey, do, does my product, can my product do what uh, you require? As I've been involved in. Uh, in many of these um, um, RFPs, uh, my background in Salesforce, uh, where we try to fit the purpose of the requirements or, and also trying to understand, okay, what is the business value? What is the need behind it? And can we actually, uh, you know, offer a solution which then could be like, you know, maybe a small demo or like a proof of concept and uh, also showing the speed of delivery uh, if it's then going to be a, uh, a good fit. For the uh, yeah, for your requirements. Okay, then the last one, seven six. Um, well, here you uh, have all these design options from seven five, 
and there you can start doing an analysis of the potential va value they uh, may have and uh, come up with a, a solution you recommend. So that's what this is about. Next slide, please. OK, so a, a very um, well, a technique almost everybody knows, I think, is the is the business case. So what you do here is you start checking all the options, uh, whether they have whether worthwhile. So is this option worthwhile considering the the amount of time and resources we need to spend? Um, and what value it will live, uh, deliver for our, our organization. So define the need and determine the desired outcomes. So that's what you typically do. And then you uh, start assessing the scope, the feasibility, uh, the assumptions, risk and constraints, and do some financial analysis to make sure um, yeah, what the most, what, what the best uh, design option is and, and recommend that that solution. Hmm. And yeah, <clears throat> a technique financial analysis. Most of the time you can use a, a return on investment. So this is typically a theory slide from Babok. They mention these kind of methods you can use to find out uh, what in a financial perspective the best option would be. But this is just a financial check. And of course, I mentioned before, risk is, is an also an important one. Uh, suppose uh, Luke showed us the, the, the vendors. Um, you, you choose a vendor that has a, a bad name or is in financial trouble. <clears throat> that might be a big risk to choose that vendor. So um, don't go there. I would say uh, choose another vendor that is that has maybe a better image or may a be better reputation or has better f financial uh, numbers. Uh, so um, it, it's it's about money, but it's not all about money. It's also about risks uh, and and impacts for your for your organization. I would say. So does it impact your organization a lot or or not? So yeah, and uh, this is not in Babok, but I think this is again another helpful uh, tool you can use, the SFA matrix. And the SFA stands for suitability, feasibility and acceptability. So here you could say, OK, well, we have um, for suitability, is there a strategic fit? So in what way does the option, the design option, fit the strategy? Is that very much so? Use plus plus. Is it not so much? Use plus minus, plus minus. Uh, does the option fit the technology requirements? So is it something that fits our uh, technology or not? Uh, does the option meet the needs of customers? Very important. Uh, for feasibility, is there sufficient budget available? So do we have the money? Uh, to what extent can the organization bear the change of the order? So that would be an impact. So can the organization bear the change? Or is the option technologically feasible? Yeah, can we do it? or not if we say well we have a bespoke uh, option but we are not we don't have the programmers to do it then it's probably a bad option <laughs> so then you fill in minus minus yeah you cannot or you don't have the money or you don't have the people to do it forget it acceptability what are the risks okay well uh, does it have risks involved like the vendor that has uh, a bad financial record uh, what's the R roi the return on investment. What do our customers think? Well, you can, the, all the aspects you can think of yourself. So that's an important one for SFA matrix to have a holistic view of the organization and the impacts it may have on your organization. So it's not just choosing something that is financially the best choice, 
but it it has more to it than just the, the finance. So the SFA matrix helps you visualizing this. Yeah, I think it's a quite a hot topic right now where we have to talk about the war of talent, right? Have getting getting the right people to do the job. I mean, uh, especially talk a lot with companies where uh, they talk about the whole decision. Okay, do we make it ourselves, or do are we going to buy a product? Uh, and we're always with with making it yourself. You really should ask yourself, okay, is it a uniquely identifying what we do with our core business and if so do we then need to allocate uh, all of our developers to that single product but then probably has a decision outsource uh, or buy products that maybe can do let's say the more site uh, uh, process uh, um, delivery uh, because it's impossible nowadays with the war for talent especially within development uh, areas uh, and architecture that you will have enough people to build everything yourself yeah. Wrap up. And that uh, concludes. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, we are right, uh, right on the hour. So again, uh, a good full packed show was a lot of information. I do think that probably after watching this video, you think, hey, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of content. Uh, we talked about models, about techniques, um, and again, uh, this is just a snapshot to give you a bit of an idea like what is the chapter, uh, in this case uh, seven of the Babel uh, is really doing, explaining what are the, the goals and objectives, uh, what should you be able to do as a business analyst. Uh, uh, but yeah, we will have some of these topics uh, highlight in future sessions where we really go in depth. Uh, um, so hopefully, uh, yeah, stay tuned for those uh, topics as well. But just to highlight today, uh, we really talked about specifying uh, requirements, uh, verifying and validating them, making sure that uh, you understood what you have elicited uh, correctly. Uh, and then with that, you can start to you know, design, uh, define design options, and then also uh, with or without the help of others, uh, also kind of already shortlist, like, okay, which design options are actually the most Feasible. I mean, uh, like like we said, uh, will we build our, something ourselves, knowing that the market is very tough right now, might not be the best option. Uh, but it's typically something you would do with, you know, uh, more people uh, that also understand more about the financial situation. Maybe you talk with HR. So there can be many aspects of people you involve. Uh, so it's not something you you know alone do as a business analyst. Uh, this is typically where also multiple disciplines come together where you are going to analyze the different options, but you're basically providing them with the options, not so to make the final you know decisions and conclusions, but just there to help facilitate the discussions. That's the most important thing. Um, yeah, so uh, hopefully uh, you enjoyed the show again. And if there are any questions then i would say i'm now going to open up the um, um the floor for any any questions if not then i uh, thank you very much again for your engagement for the people that were here online with us today uh, and otherwise for the people that are listening to this video later on thank you for uh, for watching us and uh, yeah subscribe if you're interested in any of our more uh, shows that will follow